This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Well, it's Thursday at three o'clock, another day for Condo Insider, Hawaii's show about living in an association, both condos and homeowner associations. And I kind of feel like a child on the Christmas Eve because next Wednesday, our legislature opens session. And last year we had 157 bills that affect associations introduced. So I'm waiting with bated breath to find out what bills are going to come about this year and, and what people have in mind and how to change association living. But we'll give you some more reports on that in the future. And as soon as we know what's going on, uh, we're hopeful that it'll be a great year because we're always interested in balancing the rights of, of the owners as well as the board so they can have a nice place to live. Today I've asked a good friend of mine, Nalan, an attorney, to come and talk to us again about the proverbial word service animals and comfort animals. You know, there's a whole lot of misunderstanding about this and associations more and more are finding out that homeowners are saying, well, we have a no pet rule, however, I need to have a pet for these reasons, and they call them uh, comfort animals. Although, probably technically speaking, the term would be assistance animal. But anyway, so I've asked Nalan, who's a very good friend of mine, a very competent lawyer here in Hawaii, to join us. I love seeing you always. So uh, uh, tell us a little bit again, remind our viewers about your background a little bit. Good afternoon. Uh, very glad to be here. Um, my name is Nalan. I'm of counsel with the law firm Damon Kilia Kapchak Hastert. Uh, I was born and raised in China, came to Hawaii in 2004 as a student, uh, fell in love with this place and, you know, settled down with my husband and two sons on this island. Uh, I graduated from UH Law School, and then uh, since then I have been uh, representing condominium and community associations for almost nine years. Uh, in 2012, I joined the Legislative Action Committee of the Community Associations Institute Hawaii chapter, and I've been lobbying for our industry along with my fellow members, including you. Um, so a little bit about my firm. Uh, we, uh, our firm was founded in 1963, has deep roots with our community, and also with Worldview, because we are the Hawaii exclusive member of the Meritas. It's a worldwide law firm uh, network with 179 independent firms in almost uh, 80 countries. Our legal team includes 28 attorneys, 23 uh, legal staff, su supporting legal staff. We provide full services to condominium and community associations and cooperative housing corporations. We have the capacity and the experience uh, handling all association matters, including other uh, compliance consulting, their transactional matters, uh, dispute resolution, foreclosure collection and litigation and in, in, insurance coverage matters. We really emphasize on um, delivering quality services to our clients as problem solvers within their legal budget. Well, I know you do some volunteer work, for mm -hmm. example, CAI, Legislative Action Committee. Right. Uh, what is that and what, what do they do? We basically, uh, you know, like uh, testify in front of legislators. Uh, we monitor, review all the bills relevant to associations. And then we, uh, you know, of course, we take positions. Uh, we take polls among the associations, including board directors, property managers, get their input. And then we uh, provide written oral testimonies on behalf of associations, lobbying for associations. And then after that is done, we do the uh, education promotion in the community to inform all the industry stakeholders about new laws passed in Hawaii affecting community associations and condominiums. Yeah, I think one of the misunderstood things about that, uh, in my opinion, is that CAI, which is the world's largest industry organization for mm -hmm. community associations, the Virginia Home Office, for lack of a better word, appoints 12 members here in Hawaii to the LAC Committee, Legislative Action Committee. Mm -hmm. And my recollection is that they're evenly divided between homeowners, board members, vendors like insurance companies and lawyers, right. and management companies. So it's not a biased organization. It has the input of all the relevant parts of our industry as we review bills and make a decision on what we want to support or not support. Yes, and there's actually restrictions on, you know, certain numbers of homeowners and also, uh, you know, like it's like a very uh, divided 
you know, with everybody in stake also serving on the board and with, you know, guaranteed percentage. Well, since we're going into the legislative mm -hmm. session, I would just remind all of our viewers that uh, we put out information what's before us, and the legislature is very moved by testimony. And there's a website we'll discuss next week where you have the ability to go in and with a touch of a few keys, you can submit testimony for or against the bill. You don't have to do a lot of writing or be specific. You can even just say I'm for or against, and then you can put a, a comments in the comment section. But it's very important that all of you who are engaged in this uh, share your views with the legislature, no matter what they are, no matter whether you agree with us or not. But the legislature is very moved by that testimony, of which, frankly, there's not very much every year. It's left to uh, a few industry organizations to advocate the best. Definitely, yeah. Well, let's talk about something that's, uh, I don't think it's controversial. It is controversial. Why should I say that? And, you know, following this, and having been in the industry for 25 years, I see a change where people move into an association. They know the bylaws or house will say no pets or some limitation on pets. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, they show up with pets. And some of the most recent cases that I have seen, both locally and nationwide, was the one, for example, in Hawaii Kai, where the owner had two chickens. And then there was the case on Delta Airlines where they bought a ticket for a turkey. And I thought that was interesting. It was the weekend before Thanksgiving. I <laughs> always wondered whether it was a round trip ticket or not. But they bought a ticket for the turkey. And when, of course, the gate attendant said, uh, what is this? They said, well, it's my emotional support turkey. Mm -hmm. And we've seen it with pigs. We've seen it with snakes. We've seen it with goats. It seems like a rising trend where people are saying they're in need, maybe rightfully so, mm -hmm. of a assistance animal or emotional support animal. So let's begin with the basics. Right. What is the difference between a service animal and an assistance animal? I'm going to call them emotional support animals since that's what everybody characterizes them. Okay. So uh, service animal, it's really a, a concept defining the American Disabilities Act, which applies only to places of public accommodation. So, you know, in terms of associations, unless your association takes a specific action to open itself up to the public, ADA actually won't apply to your place because it only governs places of public accommodation. Uh, the, the other law, um, emotional support animal, or the broader concept, assistant animal, which included both emotional support animal and service animal, this is a concept created by Federal, uh, Federal uh, Fair Housing Act which uh, applies to all condominium and community associations because we are multi-unit housing. And it also, this law is broad that it not only prohibits, you know, like a discrimination in terms of operation, leasing, or sale in the housing, situ multi-unit housing situation. It also, you know, has other bases that you, you, you should protect, for example, like a gender, uh, you know, race, race and, uh, you know, sex and, religion, familiar status, so it, uh, it offers a much more broader uh, you know, protection here. For a service animal, under ADA, it, it only has to be uh, you know, trained dogs or miniature horses. But for emotional support animal, there is really no restriction on what type of animal it can be. It can be any types of animal that you know, really helps the disabled person alleviate some, some kind of uh, symptom of them. Um, it doesn't have to be trained, uh, you know, there's no certification process for them. Uh, so yeah, it, they are different. For, I think there's also another act called Air Carrier Access Act, which is for air traveling. You know, a literally service animal, emotional support animal, they got a free ticket, but for pets, the owner would have to pay for a ticket to, in order for them to be on the, on the air flight. Well, it seems to me, you know, that I understand that we want those who have a disability to have access to whatever they need mm -hmm. to make their life more productive and beneficial and happier. No one is arguing what I'm going to call the legitimate disabled person. Right. So can it can be said to have, let's just use, is this the term used everybody, this is, we know it's an assistant animal, this is called comfort animal for the show. Okay. Is it, can it be said to be able to have a comfort animal, you have to have a disability? Yes. 
So they have to have some disability, mm -hmm. which now throws out the question of this person says, I need my emotional support cat. What questions can you ask that person? Can you, did you just have to accept it on face value or can you say to that person, well, you know, we have a no pet policy here. We certainly want to recognize your rights uh, if you have a disability. Mm -hmm. You must be able to ask some questions mm -hmm. and not just take at face value that they said, I have a disability or can you ask questions? Yeah, you definitely can ask questions. Uh, first, we have to correct for assistant animal or emotional support animal, they are not pets. You have to consider them as a different category. Uh, so when the owner has a disability, they have a need for assistant animal or emotional support animal, they make a reasonable request for accommodation, then you have to consider. And what kind of question you can ask is you can seek information from, let's say, uh, treating health care professional or a mental health uh, you know, care professional or social worker or, you know, anybody who's really familiar with the, his or her situation to ask to verify whether there is any disability and whether the animal is uh, needed to alleviate any symptom in connection with a disability. That's the thing you can ask. You cannot ask for more, like uh, access to medical record, that's a no. You cannot, you know, uh, ask the animal to do certain thing, whether there's a training or something. No, there's no certification for that. And you cannot enforce them to have to fill out your forms. You cannot do that. Now, is, do you have to, as a, if you're the person who has the emotional support animal, mm -hmm. do you have to tell the association, give them, I'm not saying fill out a form, mm -hmm. but do you have to say to them, I want you to know I have an emotional support animal? Or can they just do it on their own until you ask about it? They, they do have to initiate a request, either orally or in writing. The, the, for a Fair Housing Act, it, because it's a reactive statute, they have to make the request and then you react to that. That's the difference between ADA and FHA. And so the, the, the short answer is yes, mm -hmm. they have to make a request. They have to make a request. And then you have the right to ask for some type from whether it be a social worker or a doctor, mm -hmm. you're, you're able to ask for some sort of, quote, proof on proof mm -hmm. that they have a disability under the act. Mm -hmm. And that's what they have to do, part yes. one. Yeah. Part two, we're gonna take a short break for one minute. We'll be right back to talk more about emotional support animals and emotional support talk show hosts. So we'll be right back. Planning all week for the day of the big game. Watching at home just doesn't feel the same. What on the list is who's gonna drive? It's nice to know you're gonna get home alive. Plan for fun and responsibility. Choose the DD. Captain of our team is the DD. For every game day, assign a designated driver. But grandmother, what big eyes you have. She said. What are you doing? <laughs> Research says reading from birth accelerates our baby's brain development. Push. Oh! Read aloud 15 minutes. Every child, every parent, every day. They said I could play, so any chance to play at all. You know, that's my life. I love music. Yeah. That's how we do it. We're back to Condo Insider talking about emotional support animals. And we're with Nadline, a prominent local lawyer who does all sorts of association things, but is very knowledgeable about this issue. And when we finished, we talked about the fact that if a person in your association uh, believes they have the right to an emotional support animal, that number one, they have to make a request, either orally or in writing. And number two, you can ask for documentation uh, to provide some type of reasonable evidence, not about their medical condition and their medical records, but just some kind of validation that they have a disability, because you have to have a disability also for an emotional support animal, that they have some sort of disability. So very general in terms, but you have that right. But let me ask you this question. I have personal experience with this, because I was curious. Right. So I got my internet out, went into Google, 
did a support for emotional support animal certificate, found a website that for $69.95, by filling out this online form and taking this online questionnaire about my mental state, that I could get potentially, if I passed or failed, or I don't know if it's passed or failed the mental test, mm -hmm. but if I did this test, I could get a certificate. So I decided to start the process. And I was eating a donut, it was breakfast time, so I decided to name my, my fake elephant Donut. And so I filled out the form for my pygmy elephant Donut and submitted it, and then they said, and they directed me to these 10 questions. And basically, do you ever feel lonely? You know, if I answered them the way I wanted to, knowing they were steering me to answer them a certain way, flash! Up comes, congratulations, you've passed the test. You're entitled to an emotional support certificate for your pygmy elephant donut. Now, I never paid the $69.95, but how does that fit into all this? It seems to me with the way the internet is today, right. does it have to be a local person saying you have a disability, it can be anybody? Are these certificates valid? I mean, how does this all fit into the scheme of this? I mean, there are definitely like a fraud abuses out there, but unfortunately, the law doesn't clarify. You know whether that you know person who provides the certification or that supporting ladder has to be from a local professional or you know this online servicer would work. And in many cases, the the work. I mean, if you don't, uh, you know, just you, you just deny that, just question that without any further uh, investigation or an analysis you could get into trouble with the Hawaii Civil Rights Commission. But there are also cases where we read in the news, you know, you know, this is really easy to get, like a certificate like you mentioned. We have to consider about it. if you live in an apartment building, apparently having an elephant there as an emotional support animal, that's not practical. So you know that you have another basis to deny it. And of course, there are other uh, rules, assisted animal, and including service animal, they have to follow. Uh, if they are in breach of those terms, uh, you know, you have a right to remove those kind of animals, but still offer that owner or resident, you know, a, a chance to enjoy or use that housing without the presence of the animal. So in theory, if you had an animal mm -hmm. and you didn't have it on a leash or it, it created an unnecessary, consistent nuisance as a noise mm -hmm. or other types of problems because of the uh, multifamily housing, we all live close together. Those issues may be valid reasons not to allow them, not the fact that they are not allowed to have a support animal, but the animal itself can't comply with the rules of the association. Yes, uh, I always recommend my clients to adopt a assistant animal policy to make it clear, you know, what are the things assistant animal owners have to, you know, follow so that everybody's on the same page. I read an article recently about a case and. I forget what state it was, it wasn't in Hawaii, where the person had uh, emotional support goats. And uh, they tried to use an online certificate mm -hmm. to support it. But I believe what, what the issue was is that, you know, many governing documents you're only allowed to have domestic animals, domesticated animals. Mm -hmm. Well, is a goat a domesticated animal? Probably not. An elephant, certainly not. Mm -hmm. And a snake, certainly not. You know, it's, uh, so I think, you know, there's going to be areas that uh, people may not think that they want to have. In the case of the chickens in the Hawaii Kai, they were mm -hmm. domesticated special chickens. I forget their names now, they had cute names. So it's, it's really a very gray area, I think, that association boards, because the penalties are pretty severe mm -hmm. if you interfere with their rights. So uh, I, I guess the appropriate suggestion would be to, if you have this issue, to get legal counsel. Yes, every case has to be determined on a case-by-case -case analysis. You cannot just use a blanket rule to see yes or no. I had another case too, which I thought was interesting, mm -hmm. where, and I'll make your comment about it, where the owners had a dog, and they said the dog was an emotional support dog. Mm -hmm. And because the dog was kind of a high-strung dog, the dog needed an emotional support dog to keep it company so it wouldn't be so high strung. <laughs> so does the, does the statute provide for the, 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 the emotional support animal to have an emotional support animal? 
No. But, you know, there's actually no restriction on the number of emotional support animal one owner can have, one resident can have. I mean, if this owner is smart enough, he can see both are his emotional support animal, that, you know, he's going to have a stronger case of keeping them. Yeah, I think that's, that's the issue. And of course, if you had a husband and wife, one could say, this is my emotional support animal, and this is your emotional support animal. And, but in some ways, a lot of people feel it's being used to get around the no pet rules because mm -hmm. people want to have a pet, and they call it an emotional support animal. And I want to, again, say to everybody watching, we, as an industry, totally support any disabled person from having all of the resources necessary to make their life a great life. But at the same time, uh, when we had, you know, the, the bill that I saw that was, the, the legislature tried to deal with this for about two years. Mm -hmm. And what the California legislature did mm -hmm. was make it a misdemeanor for a person like a doctor or a social worker to misstate a person has a disability when they don't have a disability. Right. And they put it on the person providing the certificate because the question is whether they're going to jeopardize their license in deference to somebody who mm -hmm. may not uh, qualify. Yeah. You know, and, and I, our legislature has not taken that up, but to me that's probably a good first step to try to put some degree of, of check and balance in this, that, that, the, that it be a misdemeanor for a licensed person, social worker, doctor, or whatever it may be, mm -hmm. to falsely state a person has a disability when they don't. Yes. Comments? I agree. I mean, there are several states actually followed California step. They have uh, certain laws in place try to discourage people from, you know, like using, abusing this or, you know, engaging in fraud regarding assisted animals. Uh, but in order to have a good law, you know, really balancing the disabled person's rights as versus to have a effective, you know, like uh, restriction in place that's going to uh, discourage them from, you know, other people from abusing this. It's always a very hard line to walk. Uh, you know, you don't want to be like creating too much burdens on the disabled person because there are legitimate needs there. But at the same time, even if you have certain rules like that, it's always kind of hard to enforce as well. So I think we've seen bills in Hawaii in previous legislatures coming up. Uh, it just the bill never got a family passed through. Uh, you know, I think with the trend going on like this, we may see more bills coming up. We'll see how it plays out in the future. You know, it's interesting to me, my experience, I'm not trying to advocate this uh, on behalf of all the other organizations out there, but my recollection was that the testimony from the disabled disability organizations were in support because they too mm -hmm. don't want to see this misuse because it affects them in the future too. You know, definitely because it sends the wrong message and it's the wrong perception of mm -hmm. what the issues are. So we didn't get much pushback other than from the Hawaii Civil Rights Commission. That was the one who didn't like this bill particularly for some reason, and and. Uh, uh, I guess my question to you is should the board be concerned about the Civil Rights Commission, Hawaii Civil Rights Commission stepping in if uh, they don't handle this properly? Well, I mean, that's w the whole purpose of why we have a Civil Rights Commission there. They're trying to do their job. I mean, that's why, you know, associations, when you get these kind of issues, you got to be cautious and seek legal counsel when you're unsure of the answer. That's always a good practice. So, you know, but the Civil Rights Commission co could go in and uh, create an order and yes. they could fine you, I think. They I can. think they could um, also make the boards go to educational classes mm -hmm. as part of a settlement agreement. So I don't think we should take them lightly that they certainly have a valid, legitimate job to do and they've done a lot of good things in the state here right. uh, to help protect people uh, in, in classes that need protection. Yeah. But I think the message is that what we said earlier, when a board has this problem, number one, seek legal advice. Mm -hmm. And then number two, don't take it for granted that the Civil Rights Commission won't step in if that particularly aggrieved person files a complaint. It can be a tenant, doesn't have to be an owner yeah. in an association. So. Yeah, they definitely have the right to investigate and issue fines or like even give a right to sue like kind of statement to the, you know, um, 
you know, like a damaged person or in injured person, like a disabled person, and then they also have the right to issue fines, damages, or legal fees and costs. And although not exactly relevant to our show, I guess okay. when it comes to the Hawaii Civil Rights Commission, another class of owner that may need protection would be if boards didn't handle the uh, medical marijuana issue correctly, you know, they didn't allow mm -hmm. what the law provides. So it's not just, um, Civil Rights Commission is not there just for, quote, emotional support animals. They're there for a lot of classes of people who have protected rights under the fair housing law and other laws uh, is, uh, to protect them. So we should be very cognizant that the risks are high if they don't address these mm -hmm. things properly and it's back to as much as you don't want to spend money, you should you should use a lawyer in these cases because it's very technical in nature, and you can stub your toe pretty good. The effective way is really to prevent dispute instead of getting yourself into those kind of trouble. So having a clear assisted animal policy, know what you can do, what you cannot do, that's the right way to go. Any final comments before we close the show on emotional support animals? I mean, for our audience, uh, you know, try your best not to abuse this, you know, right we are having. And then if you have, a, you know, like a urge to really participate in our legislative process when certain bills coming up, I would encourage you to voice your opinion, to vote for a certain way, and then we know what the public really wants. Okay, well, thank you for being here today. You're always a wealth of knowledge, particularly in this subject, but many subjects. We look forward to having you watch us next week at Condo Insider at 3 o'clock. If you ever have any suggestions for our show, you're welcome to contact us and provide us information with what you'd like to see. We're going to have quite a new extensive courses on some fire safety options next week. But we thank you for watching Condo Insider and aloha.